from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're live here in Seattle for theCUBE's exclusive coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2018. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. Our next guest is Stefan Fable, who's the Director of Product Management at Canonical. CUBE alumni, welcome back. Good to see you. Thank you, good to see you too. Thanks for uh, having so me. You guys are always in the middle of all the action. It's fun to talk to you guys. Have all, you have a pulse on the developers, you have a pulse on the, on the ecosystem. You've been deep in it for many, many years. Great value. What's hot here? What's the announcement? What's the hard news? Let's get the hard news out of the way. What, what's, happening? <laughs> what's happening here at the show for you guys? Uh, we've, had, uh, we've had a great number of announcements, uh, uh, you know, a great number of threads of work that came into fruition over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, now just last week, where we announced hardware reference architectures with uh, our hardware partners, Dell and Supermicro. We announced hard ARM support, uh, ARM64 support for Kubernetes. We released our version uh, 113 of our charm distribution of Kubernetes. Um, last week, and we also uh, released, very proud to release, MicroKates. Uh, you know, Kubernetes in a single snap for your workstation in the latest uh, release 113. Yeah, maybe explain that, because you know, we, we often talk about scale, um, but there, there's big scale, and then we're talking about edge, we're talking about so many of these things. That's right. You know, that small scale is super important, so. It really is, yeah. it really is. So, MicroKates came out of this idea that um, you know, we want to enable a developer to just quickly stand up a Kubernetes cluster on their, on their workstation. And it really came out of this idea to, to really enable, um, for example, AI ML workloads locally um, from development on the workstation all the way to on-prem and into the public cloud. So that's kind of where this whole thing started. And it ended up being um, you know, uh, quite obvious to us that, that if we do this in a snap, then we actually can also tie this into appliances and devices at the edge. So now we're looking at interesting new uh, use cases for Kubernetes at the edge as an actual API endpoint. So it's uh, quite nice. Stefan, talk about, I want to take a step back. There's kind of dynamics going on in this Kubernetes wave, which by the way is phenomenal. 8,000 people here at KubeCon, up from 4,000. It's got that hockey stick growth, almost like a Moore's Law, if you will, for, con for the events. You guys have been around, so you have a lot of existing big players that have been in the space for a while, doing a lot of work around cloud, multi-cloud, you know, or whatever, what else, the new word, but again, you guys have been there. You got yeah. like the Cisco's of the world, you guys, big players actively involved, a lot of new entrants coming in. What's, the pers what's your perspective of what's happening here? A lot of people looking at this, scratching their heads saying, okay, I get Kubernetes, I get the magic of Kubernetes, enables a lot of things. What's the impact to me? What's in it for me as an enterprise or a developer? How do you guys see this marketplace developing? What's really going on here? Well, I think that uh, the, the draw to this, uh, to this uh, conference and to the technology and, and all the different vendors, et cetera, is ultimately the multi-cloud uh, experience, right? It is about enabling workload portability and enabling uh, the operator to operate Kubernetes independently of where that is being deployed. And oh, that's actually also the core value proposition of our Charmed Kubernetes. The idea that a single operational paradigm allows you to experience, to deploy, lifecycle manage, and, and administer Kubernetes on-prem, as well as on any of the public clouds, as well as on uh, you know, other virtual substrates, uh, such as VMware. Um, so ultimately, I think the, the, the consolidation of, um, of of application delivery into a single container format, such as Docker and um, uh, you know other compatible formats, OCI formats, right? Those, uh, uh, you know, that was ultimately a really good thing because it enabled that portability. Now I think the question is, I know how to deploy my applications in multiple uh, ways because it's always the same API, right? But how do I actually manage a lot of Kubernetes clusters and a lot of uh, Kubernetes yeah. API endpoints all over the place? So break down the hype and reality because again. A lot of stuff looks good on paper, love the sound yeah. bites of people saying, hey, Kubernetes, all this. But there's people are admitting there's some things that need to be done, work areas, uh, security is a big concern, are working, people are working on that. Where's the reality? Where does the rubber meet the, uh, meet the road when it comes down to, okay, I'm an enterprise. What am I buying into with Kubernetes? How do I get there? We heard Lyft take an approach to saying, look, it's solve one problem, get a beachhead, yeah. and kind of incremental, take the incremental approach. Where's the hype, where's the reality? Separate that for us. So I think that there's certainly a lot of hype around the, um, the technology aspect of, of Kubernetes, right? Obviously containerization is on vogue, you, you know, this is uh, how uh, 
developers choose to, to uh, you know, engage in application development. We have uh, microservices architectures, all of those things we're very well aware of and have been around for quite some time and in the conversation. Now, uh, looking at container management, container orchestration at, at scale, right, it was a natural fit for something like Kubernetes to, to become um, you know, quite popular in this space. And so uh, from a technology perspective, I'm not, I'm not, su uh, I'm not surprised. I think the, um, the rubber meets the road, as always, in two things, right? in economics and in operations. <laughs> so if I uh, can uh, roll out uh, more Kubernetes clusters per day or uh, more containers per day than my competitor, I gain a competitive advantage, right? That the cost of per container is ultimately what's going to be the, um, you know, the deciding factor here. Yeah, yeah. So, Stefan, when I think about developers, how do I start with something and then how do I scale it out in the economics of that? Boy, I, I think uh, you know Canonical, and, and you know has a lot of experience with that uh, to, to share. What, what are you seeing? What you know? What's the same? What's different about you know this ecosystem, cloud native versus you know when we were just talking about Linux or previous waves of you know, infrastructure? Well, I think that um, ultimately. Uh, Kubernetes in and of itself is a, is a mechanism to enable developers, right? So it is, it plays one part in the whole software development life cycle and accelerates a certain part. Um, now it's on us, uh, distributors of Kubernetes, to ensure that all the other portions of this whole life cycle and ecosystem around Kubernetes, where do I deploy it? How do I life cycle manage it? If there's a security breach like last Monday, what happens to my existing stack and how does that go down? Like, that acceleration is not solved by Kubernetes, it's solved for Kubernetes. Yeah, and you know, you, your, your software lives in lots and lots of environments. Um, maybe you can help clarify for people trying to understand how Kubernetes fits and when you're playing with the public clouds, you know, your Kubernetes versus their <laughs> Kubernetes, and uh, right. the, the distinction I think is there's a lot of nuance there that people it's need, need help with. It's true, yeah, so I think that uh, first of all, I mean, we always distanced ourselves from the notion of having our Kubernetes. I think uh, we have a distribution of Kubernetes. I think there's uh, conformance uh, tests that are in place, that, that they're in place for a reason. I think it is the right approach and we won't install a forked version of Kubernetes uh, anytime soon. Uh, certainly um, that is one of the principles we, we adhere to. Um, what, I, what is different about our distribution of Kubernetes is the operational tooling and the ability to really uh, cookie cutter out Kubernetes clusters that feel identical even though they're distributed and spread across multiple different substrates. So I think that is really the, um, the, the fundamental difference in, uh, of our Kubernetes distribution versus others uh, that are out there in the market. Talk about the role of developers now, because obviously you're seeing a lot of different personas of emerging in this world. I'm just going to lay them out there and I want to get your reaction. The classic application developer, the ones who are sitting there writing code inside a company, could be a consumer company like Lyft or an enterprise company that needs to, they're rebuilding inside. So it's clear that CIOs or enterprises, CXOs or whatever the title is, they're bringing more software in-house, bringing that competitive advantage under application development. You have the IT pro expert, practitioner kind of role, classic IT, and then you got the open source community vibe, right. this show. So you got these three things interplaying with each other, this show, to me, can, feels a lot like an open source show, which it is, but it also feels a lot like an IT show. Which it also is. <laughs> it also is. And it feels like an app development show, which it right. also is. So, opportunity, yeah. challenge, is this a marketplace condition? What's your thoughts on these kind of personas? Well, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's really a question of how, how far are you willing to go in, in your implementation of DevOps cultural change, right? If you, if you look at the, um, uh, sort of that, mo that notion of, of, of DevOps and that, that that movement that has really uh, taken a hold in people's minds and hearts over the last couple of years, we're still far off in, in, in a lot of ways, in a lot of places, right? Even the places who are saying they're doing DevOps, they're still quite early, if at all, in, uh, in, on that adoption curve. I think um, bringing operators, developers, and IT professionals together in a single show is a great way for the community and for the market to actually engage in a larger DevOps conversation uh, without the constraint of the individual enterprise that those teams find themselves in. If you can just talk about how you should do something better and how would that work, and there's other kinds of uh, personas and roles at the same table, it is much better uh, to have that conversation without the constraint of like a deadline or a milestone or you know uh, some outage somewhere, right? Like something is always going on. Being able to just have that conversation around a technology yeah. 
and really say, hey, this is going to be the one that we, uh, that the vehicle that we use to solve this problem and further that conversation, I think it's extremely powerful. Yeah, and we always talk about who's winning and who's losing. It's what media companies do. We do it on the queue, <laughs> we debate it. At the end of the day, we always like, there's no, get, there's no magic quadrant for this kind of market, um, but the scoreboard can be customers. Now Amazon's got over 5,000 reputable customers. I don't know how many CNCF has. It's probably a handful, not, not 5,000. Right. The customer implications is really the, where this is going, right? Multi-cloud equals choice. What's your conversations like with customers? What do you see on the customer landscape in terms of appetite, IQ, or progress for DevOps? I mean, we were talking, not everyone's on serverless yet, and that's so obvious that's going to be a big thing. Right. Um, so, enterprises are hot right now, they want the tech, seeing the cloud growth. Where's your customer base? What are those conversations like? Where are they in the adoption of cloud native? It's an extremely interesting question, actually, because it really depends on whether they started with pass or not. <laughs> if they ever had a pass strategy, then they're uh, mostly disillusioned. Uh, they, they came out, they thought it was going to solve a huge problem for them and save them a lot of money, and it turns out that developers want more flexibility than any pass approach really was able to offer them, right? So ultimately, they're saying, you know what, let's go back to basics. I just give you a, a Kubernetes API endpoint. You already know how to deal with you know, everything else beyond that, and actually, you know, you're not cookie cuttering out uh, PostgreSQL. Uh, so Docker Kubernetes images, is a reset right? to pass. It really does. It kind of disrupted that whole space, yeah, right? Uh, and and took a step back. You would like an extra All right, uh, Stefan, how about serverless? So a lot of discussion about Knative here. We've been teasing out where that fits compared to functions from AWS and Azure. What, what's the canonical uh, you know, take on this? Uh, what are you hearing from your customers? So serverless is uh, one of those um, well, it's certainly a hot technology and an interest, a technology of interest to our customers. Um, but you, you know, and we have long-standing partnerships um, uh, with Galactic Fog and others in in place around serverless. Uh, I haven't seen, you know, real production deployments of that yet, and it's. Frankly, it's probably going to take a little lo a bit longer before that materializes. I do think that there's a lot of uh, efforts right now in containerization. Lots of folks are at that point where they are ready to and are already running containerized workloads. I think they're busy now implementing Kubernetes. Once they have done that, I think they'll, uh, they'll think a little bit more about serverless. One of the things that interests me about this ecosystem is, is the rise of Kubernetes, the rise of choice, the rise of a lot of tools, a lot of services, um, trying to fend off the, the tsunami wave that's hit the beachhead of Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I've always said in theCUBE that that's, they're going to take as much inland territory on this tsunami unless someone puts up a seawall. And that's, the, I think this is this community here. And I think the question is, is that, and I want to get your expert opinion on this, because the behemoths, the big guys, are getting richer. The innovation's coming from them, they have scale. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that as a key point in the value of Kubernetes, it's a, a scale. Um, as one of those players, uh, in, I would consider in, in the big, big, big size, not like a behemoth like an Amazon, you've you got a unique position. How can the industry move forward with disruption and innovation with the big guys dominating? What has to happen? Is, it a, is there going to change the size of certain TAMs? Is there going to be new, new service providers emerging? Something's got to give. Either the big guys get richer and at the expense of the, the little guys, or market expands with new categories. Right. How do you guys look at that? I mean, actually, developers are out well, there, so there's a promising look to new, new categories, but your thoughts? I think it's, uh, so I, a technology perspective certainly would be, there could be a disruptive technology that comes in, right, and, and just eats their lunch, which I don't believe is going to happen. But, uh, I think it might actually be uh, more of a market uh, functionality, actually. If it goes down to the economics, and uh, as they start to compete, there will be a limit to the race to the bottom, right? So if I, if I go in on an economical advantage point as a public cloud, then I can only take that so far. Now, I can still take it a lot further, but you know, there's going to be a limit to that ultimately. So I, will, I would say that, that all of the public clouds, and we see that increasingly happening, are starting to differentiate. So they're saying, you know, uh, come to me for AIM, uh, AIML, come to me for you know, a, a rich service catalog, come to me for workload portability, or something like that, right? And we'll see more differentiation as time goes yeah. on. And I think that'll develop in a little bit of a, of a bubble, right? To, to the point where actually other players who were not watching um, for example, Chinese clouds, right? Uh, very large, very influential, uh, very rich in services. They yeah. can come in and disrupt the market in a totally different way uh, that a technology uh, yeah. ever could. 
So key point you mentioned earlier, I want to pivot on that, get to the AI conversation, but scale is a competitive advantage. We've seen that, on, we said it on theCUBE, yeah. we see it in the marketplace. Kubernetes by itself is great, but at scale it gets better. Got knobs and policy. AI is a great example of where a dormant computer science concept that has not yet been unleashed, cloud gets unleashed by cloud. Now that's pro proliferating. AI, what else is out there? How do you see this, this trend around just large scale Kubernetes, AI and machine learning coming on around the corner? That's going to be unique and yeah. it's new. It so you new. mentioned the Chinese class could be a developer here. It, so it's, it's exactly a lever. Right. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. I mean, we've been involved with Kubeflow since the early days. Um, uh, early days, I mean, it's barely a year, right? So what are early days? It's a, it's a year old. It's yesterday. So, um, <laughs> uh, so a year ago, we started working with Kubeflow, um, and uh, we, we published uh, one of the first tutorials of how to actually get that up and running and started on Ubuntu and with our uh, charm distribution of Kubernetes, and it has since been a focal point of our distribution. We do a couple of things with Kubeflow. So the first thing, uh, something that we can bring as a unique value proposition is, because we're the operating system for almost all GKE, all AKS, all EKS, uh, such a strong uh, standing as an operating system and our strong partnerships with um, folks like NVIDIA, uh, it was kind of a, a, you know, one of the big milestones that we tried to achieve and we've since completed, actually as another announcement since last week, is the full automatic deployment of GPU enablement on Kubernetes clusters and have that identical experience happen across the public clouds. So GPGPU enablement on Kubernetes as one of the key enablers for projects like Kubeflow which give you machine learning stacks on demand, right? And then in parallel, we've been working with Kubeflow in the community, been very active, uh, formed a steering committee to really get the industry perspective into the needs of, uh, you know, of Kubeflow as a community and worked with everybody else in that community to, to make sure that Kubeflow um, well, releases on time and uh, hopefully soon in a 1.0, which is due this summer. But uh, right now we're there, we're focused on That's the That's a key area of innovation though, Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And we see Amazon certainly promoting that. Yeah. Uh, what else is new? We got one last question for you. What's, what's next for you guys? Get a quick plug in for Canonical. What's, what's, uh, what's coming around the corner? What's, uh, what's up? Well, we're, we're definitely happy to, uh, uh, to continue to work on the GPGPU enablement. I think that is, uh, that is one of the key, um, key aspects that needs to stay, uh, we need to stay on top of. We're looking at Kubernetes um, across many different use cases now, especially with uh, our um, uh, IoT, Ubuntu Core uh, uh, operating system, which will release shortly, and here actually having new use cases for AI ML inference, for example, out at the edge, looking at um, uh, drones, uh, robots, uh, self-driving cars, et cetera, who are, we're working with a bunch of different industry partners as well. So in increased focus on the devices side of the yeah, house yeah. Uh, can be expected in 2019. And that's key to use the data in a way that's really relevant. Absolutely. All right, Stefan, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Appreciate it. Canonicals, great insight here, bringing more commentary to the conversation here at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con. Large scale deployments is a competitive advantage. Kubernetes really does well there. Data, machine learning, AI, all part of the value proposition above and below Kubernetes. We're seeing a lot of great advances. Cube coverage here in Seattle. We'll be back with more after this short break. <laughs>